right, good morning, church. Um, excited that you guys are, are here with us this morning. It is Super Bowl Sunday, and it's, it's an exciting time. Um, I will let you guys know, um, the red that I'm wearing doesn't support the, the Chiefs. Um, I actually made this decision for Valentine's Day. Jonas, see my socks? Yeah. So, no, um, I'm excited about watching the game, um, but there are Tennessee alumni on both teams, so um, that's a win in my book. College is my sport. Um, NFL and professionals, they can do their thing. But I'm excited about um, eating and um, being able to spend time with family and friends. So I hope that you guys share in that. This morning, um, for those of you who might not know what's going on, in our fellowship hall, we're having um, a, a fundraiser meal, uh, a breakfast um, that is going to support an orphanage in Asia. And we're not going to mention the name of the orphanage because of the hostility within the country um, and, and the things that can go on there. But um, I want everyone to know that um, after service until noon, they're going to be serving pancakes and sausage. Um, you're welcome to go over there. And uh, uh, Tony and Denise Foster will be making a trip there uh, soon at the end of the month. And this this does not raise any support for Tony and Denise. This all goes towards the mission. So all the money that we make over there today, the Fosters will take with them and, and give it directly to the orphanage and the missionaries that are there in a few short weeks when they travel there. So um, if you haven't had breakfast or you have had breakfast, but now it's time for lunch, uh, when we get done here, uh, they will be serving that over there. And like I said, 100%, it's going directly to the orphanage. Um, this morning, we're going to pray um, over that mission um, and uh, uh as we open up our service. So go ahead and bow with me in prayer. Um, dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that we can gather in your house this morning. Lord, I thank you um, for the opportunity that we have to worship you this morning. Uh, Lord, right now, I just lift up the orphanage in Asia. God, we don't need to mention their name because you know their name. Uh, Lord, we don't need to mission, mention the missionaries' names that are there or the children that are a part of the orphanage, God, because you know every one of them. Um, Lord, and I just pray right now that that you work in and through that, that uh, orphanage, that you work with the mission teams that are there, the missionaries that are there, that you um, just give them the courage that they need and encouragement right now, that you surround them with your love um, and that they know that you are, that you are present and you are working um, because they see that. Lord, I thank you for the work that's already been done, for the children that have already graduated and, and uh, been able to receive education and things that the orphanage provides. And uh, Lord, I just pray for the children that are to come. Father, right now I pray that you open up our ears and our hearts to your message, that, that you speak through uh, me, that you use me as a vessel, and God, that you reveal anything that we need to be seen in our own lives. And Holy Spirit, that you go before us in that. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we cannot see. It's by faith that Abraham, when, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went, even though he didn't know the outcome, even though he didn't know the destination. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger, a foreigner in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were his heirs with him in the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with its foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so, from this one man, and he is as good as dead, came Descendants is as numerous as the stars in the sky or as the sand along the seashore. That's Hebrews 11, chapter 1, or Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Today, in Romans chapter 4, we're going to be spending time breaking down this idea of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is not only designed to tell us what faith is, but then there's this whole Hall of the Heroes of Faith, the legacy of faith that's found throughout Scripture is in Hebrews chapter 11. Paul has, has spent a lot of time talking about faith, and he's talked about how crucial faith is. In verse 16 of chapter 1, he says, It's the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. There's faith. Verse 22 of chapter 3, This righteousness is given through faith. In Jesus to all who 
believe. So you could see this reoccurring theme that centers on faith in which Paul keeps referencing, referencing his readers to. But what exactly is, is faith? I mean, we know what Hebrews 11 one says, we just read it, but, but as you talk to different people, different believers, different Christians, you can get a whole plethora of different answers. So what Paul does here in Romans 4 is he gives us an analysis of what a saving faith really is. He, he's going he's gonna to answer this, these two questions in chapter 4. What is saving faith and how do I know or how do you know if you have it? Before we jump into Romans 4 though, Paul is going to use Abraham as the main context, as an example of faith. So in order to understand the, the passage in full, we need to have a quick refresh on Abraham's story. Um, so if you remember, the Bible starts out with Adam and Eve in the garden, and they get kicked out because they mess up. They bite into the apple, and they're done. Um, life doesn't get much better very, very fast. It actually continues to get worse and worse. And then you get to Noah um, early on in Genesis, and God's basically going to hit the reset button. He's going to say, you know what, Noah, I'm going, to, I'm going to wipe out all mankind. Noah builds the boat, and, and that whole story takes place. Um, so he's hit the reset button. Well, then men come together, and in an act of defiance to overthrow God, they work to build a tower. They work together because they wanted to make a declaration of their independence from God. It's known as the Tower of Babel. This was a defiant act. So God decides he's going to scatter the nations. He's going to confuse their language. No longer <clears throat> will mankind speak the same language. After this, Genesis chapter 11, Genesis chapter 12 opens up with the story of a man named Abram. And there's a calling. God called Abram to become the father of a nation. God promised that he would one day bring salvation to the entire world, to all of mankind through his son through a descendant. Now, this sounds like a great idea. This sounds really good. But the problem was is that when he received this calling, he was already in his 70s. So was his wife. And they have no kids. Anatomy is no different today as it was in the Bible. I mean, 70-year-olds don't have children. They don't plan for children. It's not something that was physically possible thousands of years ago even. But Abraham believed, and he went. 20 years goes by. He's done everything that he needs to do. He's left everything behind. He's taken his family. He's followed God to the place that God led him to. He didn't set out to go to L.A. God didn't call him to go to L.A. or go to Orlando. Like, there was no destination. It was, hey, Abram, go, and he went. 20 years passes. There's still no child. And if 70-year-old people don't have babies, how does 90-year-old people have babies? Paul is going to break down Abraham, Abraham's faith. So God renames Abraham, or Abram to Abraham, which is he's the father of many. So he's given the name. This is who you are. This is your identity. You're the father of many. But still, he's childless. And so Paul uses Abraham's faith to demonstrate that he was justified by his faith. He does all of this to say that if Abraham, the father of many, the father of our faith, was justified by his faith, you and I are too. We are too. It's not anything more than that. So verse 1 of chapter 4, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds made him acceptable to God, he would have something to boast about. But that's, that was not God's way. For, for Scripture tells us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him righteous because of his faith. So, so real quick here, Paul is quoting Genesis chapter 15, verse 6 there. Every religious Jew that would have read this letter, that would have heard Paul speak, he would, they would have exactly known what he was talking about here. Like, like instantaneously, when he began talking about Abraham, and he talks about Genesis, the moment that he started quoting that verse, they would have memorized it. It would have been a connection point. Abraham believed God's promise that he would bring salvation to the world through one of his sons. And this is credited to him for righteousness. Even when it seemed physically impossible. Even when it was improbable. 
he knew the God that promised it was outside of the physical limitations that he had. And he believed, and he was counted righteous for it. God had saved people before Abraham, but in this moment, Abraham is the first person in Scripture that was justified by faith. God credited it to him as righteous because of his faith. Now, it's important that we understand this word credited that's there. It's so important that I'm actually going gonna, gonna to give you the word in the original Hebrew, and I'm going to try to say it. And, and I'm going to give you the word in the original Greek, and I'm going to try to say it. So Old Testament's Hebrew. Um, and in that Old Testament, in Genesis, it's written, the word is kashem. Sure, we'll go with that. Chashem. That, that sounds good. You guys can Google it later. Um, and in Greek, it was longsmai. That doesn't sound at all like Greek, but... Um, it's so important. I want you to hear the words, and I want you to understand that both of these terms are related to bookkeeping terms. So now everyone in, that's in the room right now that, that likes numbers, that's an accountant, or does spreadsheets gets really excited at this point, okay? Because where numbers are concerned, they must be what? 100% accurate, exact, precise. There's no room for error. All the way down to the, to, to the most minor detail, they have to be exact. Minor errors can cause major problems. If you don't believe me, just ask a pilot. Ask a captain. If you're one or two degrees off uh, on your instruments as you're traveling, you can end up miles away from your destination. And, and so this, this word here is for the accountants, and, and it credits an account must reflect the actual state of the finances. It's precise. It's precision. The same reasoning applies to justification. When God saved Abraham, God didn't pretend that something was true when it was actually not. It, God, God credited real righteousness to Abraham, the same perfect righteousness that he gave and credited to Jesus. There is no different. And Paul continues on here. He says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something that they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith and their forgiveness, not because of their work. So the past two weeks, we've talked about this very thing. Paul has said it over and over in, in Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 3, you are not saved by your work. You are saved by grace. But he's taking the opportunity in this moment to continue to drive that point home. He wants his readers to understand Working as a means of salvation will never obtain salvation. When it comes to establishing your rightness with God, instead of working for it and expecting it as a reward, believe in him who declares the ungodly to be righteous because he has the power to do so. In other words, believe that God accomplished what he said he was going to accomplish. Believe in that alone. When you believe in the gospel and you accept it as your truth, his righteousness is credited to you. There's that great exchange again. <clears throat> we, can, we can think about this, and what happens is uh, over time, um, sometimes we, we fail to see uh, maybe blind spots in our life. And, and if you've ever been in a really good conversation with a really good friend, like a deep conversation, uh, one that I would say happens more at like 1 a.m., um, where you're just kind of, a, a, you know, you trust this person, you love this person, and, and maybe the question pops up, like, well, how do you know you're getting to heaven? Like, like how, how do you really know? Like, I, I could tell you this, like, I've thought about this before. Like, how do I really know what I believe is really real? And how do I really know that, like, I am going to get to heaven? Sure, there's the faith element. And I'm not questioning my faith. I'm just saying, like, how do you know? And when you ask that question, you, there's about three common answers that you hear pretty regularly. Uh, the first one being, I, well, I'm just, I try my best to be a good Christian. I work hard at it, like I do, like I try. Um, the next one, you know, I believe in God and I try to do his will. I believe in God with all of my heart. Uh, just last week I was having a conversation with, with a friend and, and um, just talking about some of the things going on in their life and, and, and two of those three answers were in their conversation. That, that, was, that was their remark, like, yeah, you know, I know that these things are going on, but, like, it's, God, it's God's will, and, like, I trust in his will, and, like, I do everything I can to live by his will. Here's the misconception that's kind of exposed in these answers. Number one, that's salvation by works. I, I try my best to do good, 
I work really hard at being a good Christian. I follow all the Ten Commandments. Answer number two, salvation by faith plus works. You know, I believe in God, and I do my best to follow his will. You know, number three looks right, but usually it's this idea that salvation by faith as work. And it's basically this idea that, well, because I believe, then I'm going to get to heaven. Like, there's a reward that's expected at the end. Like, because I do these things, then I'm going to get rewarded for it. In each of these cases, the person is religious but still works for their faith, works for their salvation. Our answer to the question of why should God let us into heaven should be this simple. Because of what Jesus did. Because of what Jesus has done. Nothing more or nothing less. We can't do anything to get into heaven. And sometimes when you read over these answers, if you were asked this question Maybe it reveals a blind spot. Maybe it's one of those things where, oh, I think I would, have, I would have said number three. I don't think there's anything wrong with that answer. But the reality is, is there's nothing about us in what Jesus has done. And that's the only way we can enter to heaven. Look at what Billy Graham said. One of his last interviews, he kind of wrote an exit letter. And this is what he included. You can, you can Google this. You can see the whole, uh, it's, it's about a page long. He says this, I won't be in heaven because I have preached to large crowds, or because I've tried to leave, live a good life. I will be in heaven for one reason. Many years ago, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to make our forgiveness possible and rose again from the dead to give us eternal life. No other reason than what Jesus has already done. Paul, Paul shifts from Abraham, and he goes into King David. Verses 6 through 8, he said, David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, David said, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what a joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Now, he, Paul is being very strategic here. So Abraham is the father of their faith. Like That would be the biggest Old Testament hero to the Jewish people. Right behind Abraham would be David, King David, the legacy that he had as king. Like, that's number one and number two in the Old Testament for the Jewish, the Jewish people. And, and, and what he's doing is he's going, you hold King David in high esteem, right? And everyone's like, yes, you know, we, we love David. And he's going, hang on a second. Remember what David did with Bathsheba? Like, you remember the sins that took place there? Like, if you guys don't know the story, um, he saw Bathsheba bathing as king, and, and so he went, and he, he had her brought in. He slept with her, and she ended up pregnant while her husband is off at war fighting for Israel. And so he decides, well, I'll call her husband in. And, and you know what? I'm going to get her husband to come in, and, and he's been off at war for, for weeks. Like, he'll come in. He'll, 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 he'll spend time with his wife. But that doesn't happen. So he decides, well, you know what, I'll just get him drunk and then send him home, and he'll really spend time with his wife. Uriah slept on the porch because he was a man of honor. He, 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 the whole point of Uriah is going, look, I'm a man of integrity. I'm not going to come home and enjoy the finer things of life and the luxuries that I have while my brothers in arms are out fighting. So David calls him back in and ends up signing his death certificate. He sends him back to battle with a letter that says, put me in the most thickest part of the fight. And David schemed to cover up his sin and ended up having Uriah murdered. And, and so Paul is making a connection here. He's going, you know, you got Abraham and your boy David, who you really respect and you trust. David understood the only way that he could be forgiven is if someone was charged, and he uses that word there, credited, the, the logosmai. He, he uses that Greek word there with his sin. David deserved death that someone else is going to be charged with David's sin and, so that he could be credited again with the logosmai, with Jesus' righteousness. David says that. What a joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Paul says, just like David, our sins, which also deserve death, they're going to be covered by Jesus' blood, and we will never be charged with them because he was charged in our place. That's what he's saying. So how was Abraham saved? Paul tells us he was saved by trusting in God. 
He was saved by trusting that God would keep his promise to bring salvation to the world. And in verse 9, he shifts, not just from the how was he saved, now he's going to answer the question, well, when was he saved? Verse 9, Paul says, Now, is this blessing only for the Jew, or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentile? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted righteous by God because of his faith, but how did this happen? Was this counted as righteous only after he was circumcised, or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham had already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him righteous even before he was circumcised. Now, I, I'm not going to dive deep into uh, the idea of circumcision and the history of it. Circumcision at the very basic level was, was um, a symbol of the laws that God would one day give to Moses. So what that means is, is that circumcision was a sign that you were following the law, that you were a Jewish believer. And, and get this, guys, that, that didn't happen for hundreds of years after Abraham. That was Moses. That was Exodus. This law had not been declared yet. God declared Abraham righteous in Genesis 15, 6. Circumcision was not talked about or spoken of by God until Genesis 17. It's about 15 years later. Simply put, Paul is saying, before any of the laws were given, before there were any works to be done, he was counted righteous. He's proving a point here. He's saying you can't be saved by works because before the works were laid out, he was already saved. And he's wanting his Jewish believers to see this. You can't say that obeying the law is necessary for salvation because Abraham was saved before God ever gave him any law. And you can read that without understanding the history. You can kind of not get what Paul is saying, but that's where he's going at. Abraham was saved before there were any laws or parameters given. So how was he saved? He was saved by faith. That's what Paul says. When was he saved? He was saved before the law was ever given to him. And in the last part of this chapter, Paul is going to shift from the when and the how, and he's going to highlight some of the key characteristics that Abraham's faith uh, displays. The first being God's promise. The first being God's promise. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that, that, that he would become the father of many nations. Paul uses the word in this second part of chapter 4, the word promise. He uses it five times. He, he talks about God's promise is made up of, uh, to Abraham was made up of several layers. First off, there's the personal blessing. There's the personal blessing that he would receive. The land that God is going to give him and his descendants. The blessing on him and his descendants. The Redeemer, he's talking about Jesus, the one that would come through his descendants, through his lineage. Oh, and the last one, it all has to start with a baby. Like you're going to have a, a, a kid. Again, Abraham didn't just believe in this idea of, yeah, sure, I believe there's a God. Like I have faith in, yeah, there's a higher being. He believed in the specific promise that God had given him. And he adjusted his life around it. So faith, the faith's object is the promise of God. Faith is believing that God will do what he says he's going to do. And believing that he has done what he said he has done. And so Paul creates this bridge for us to cross. In verse 23 and 24 he says, When God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for his benefit. He, he handed over, he was handed over to die for our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Just like Abraham believed God would send a son to bring salvation into the world like he had promised, we believe that Jesus was that son. The resurrection, Paul says in verse 25, is proof. It's proof that, that, that God accepted Jesus as the payment of our sins. So therefore, when we believe in the resurrection, we are believing and we are saying, I believe it worked. I believe the tomb was empty. I believe Jesus died in my place. I believe that my sins are forgiven because they were placed on him. I believe that his righteousness is given to me because that's what God says. That was the great exchange. I believe Jesus accomplished what he said he accomplished. I, I believe that when Jesus said it is finished, that it was finished. I believe that he will return. Because it's promised. And when we do this, when we, when we live this belief out, 
It carries over into our life, and it is credited to us as righteousness. And Paul is saying that our faith is the same as Abraham's faith. Like, like there is no different faith. It's not Abraham had a different faith than we do. It's the same. We both believe that God keeps his promises and he sends us salvation. Abraham believed that God would send it and we believe that God did send it and he will return because of Jesus. The next characteristic of faith that Paul highlights is God's power. It's the power of the foundation of Abraham's faith. Verse 19, Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Now, there's lots of things that Abraham could have thought about or considered in his future. A lot of different things that, that, he could, that could have discouraged him. I mean, we've already talked about the anatomy, like he's almost 100 years old, and He's not getting any younger, and the body's not meant to do what God has said it's going to do. It would be easy to get discouraged. From the human perspective, his situation seemed impossible. It still is impossible to us today. You ask anybody, you don't even have to have a medical doctor. Any, any 10-year-old kid would probably tell you just that the basic biology that they've learned in school that 100-year-old people don't have kids. It's just not, it's not possible all the physical evidence seemed to contradict God's promise. Faith does not ignore the circumstances. Faith faces the circumstances but focuses on the God who stands behind the circumstances. Abraham chose to focus only on God's power and cling to his promise. Abraham didn't have a perfect faith. Some of you might be sitting there going, yeah, but like, um, remember what Sarah made him do? Sleep with my servant and have a kid? Yeah. And he did that, and it was a mistake. And God said, that's not the one. That's not, that's not my promise. That's your solution to my promise, but it's not mine. Depending on God alone, like this, like Abram has done, is scary. It's hard. And Abram didn't do it perfectly. If we're honest, most of us prefer a faith where we have to depend a little bit on God and a little bit more on ourselves. Like, like if God gave us this promise, you know, hey, you're, when you're about 95, you're going to have a kid. We would go, okay, God, thank you. I believe that. We got to call the doctor, honey. We got to get the red pill, the blue pill. We got to figure this thing out. We got to have a backup plan. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hop on Google and we're going to see what kind of home remedies. You know, how to have kids when you're in your 90s. What essential oil helps with that. We would want control over it. We're hoping that God keeps his promise, but we've got other ways of getting it done if he doesn't. Abraham did that. And it didn't, it didn't bode well. God said, that's not, that's not what I promised. I'm going to bless your son, but that's not, that's not the one that, that I promised. In spite of his circumstances, he did believe in God wholeheartedly. Faith is not irrational. Faith is not irrational. Nothing is more rational than to believe God's word. True faith stands with God and his word, even when doing so seems foolish from, from our perspective. Noah. Noah built the ark when rain wasn't a thing. No boat had ever been built. Everyone mocked him, and he continued to build. Moses walking out with the Israelites, hey guys, here's the sea. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going we're gonna to trust in God. That night, the winds blew and that sea parted. It's not being irrational. Nothing is more rational than to believe in God's word. And true faith stands with God at his word, and looks beyond our circumstances, and sees the God that is outside of our circumstances. The third characteristic that Paul highlights is faith boasts in God's assurance. Abraham never wavered, he said in verse 20, in believing in God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. So a big theme in, throughout the book of Romans that Paul continues uh, to talk about is, what do you boast in? I mean, if we're saved by works, he says, then, 
you know, go ahead and boast on all you have accomplished, all the Bible verses you've memorized, your perfect attendance, all the things that you have done in church, boast in those things. But if we're saved by faith, then we can only boast in what God has done. And if Abraham had had kids under his own strength when he was 90, he would have been easy to say, hey, look what I did. I mean, is that not what Eve did when she said, hey, you know what, look, I produce man. But that's not what Abraham did. The reality is, is when we get to heaven and we get a chance to talk to Abraham, he's not going to go, hey, you know what I did? I mean, I don't know about you, but like I've got a list of questions for a list of all the, the biblical heroes that we talk about. Like I'm looking forward to one day being able to sit down and just ask questions. What was it like? What happened? You know, I would love to ask John what he thought when Peter like took the sword out and slashed the ear off. And it was like, oh man, you messed up. Like those kind of questions. But the reality is, is when we get to heaven and we meet Abraham, he's not going to be talking about what he did. When, 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 when we get into heaven, he's going to say, you know what? I was a failure. Like, I messed up. I tried to fix the problems on my own. God stepped in, and he took care of it. God did it all. He gets the glory. I still had a kid when I was 100 years old. Nobody in heaven is going to be walking around talking about what we did. Like, hear this. None of us are going to be able to boast about what we did in heaven. Actually, Revelation 22, 4 says this, that, that we will literally have his name tattooed across our forehead, and we will worship and boast everything in him. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about what he accomplished. We will worship the creator of the universe, and our boasting will be in him. It will not be in ourselves. Paul wraps up this chapter, and he says, the result of a faith like this is righteousness. Like, that's the end result. Listen to how he, he closes it. When God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was, it was recorded for our benefits too, assuring us. We look back on Abraham's life. We are assured that God will also count us righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. And that righteousness is given to us when we put our faith in him and when we live our life around him. As the band makes their way back up to the stage, faith is the hand that grabs a hold of Jesus. It's that simple. It's the admission that we cannot save ourselves, that there's nothing that we can do, but that God has kept his promise and he's done it for us. It's all about what Jesus has already done. As long as we put our trust in him and we live by that, heaven is, heaven is open to us. He was faithful. Faith declares that God was gracious. Even in our sin, he still loved us. Paul said that. While we were still sinners, Christ has died for us. Though I am powerless, though you are powerless, he is powerful. He, he, is, he is faithful and he is just in all of his ways. The whole Christian life starts with, with this empowerment that he gives us. And it's sustained by this faith that God has promised us. His promise is true. Jesus came, he died, and he rose again. And his promise to return will one day happen. And we have to live on that promise. Faith is not some general belief in God or a higher being. It's the confidence in, in what God has promised. Uh, that, that he will one day remove our sin. Or that he has removed our sin. He will remove our debt. He turns us into righteous people. And he will one day return for us. Faith is not a perfect life. Abraham didn't live it. None of the men or women throughout Scripture lived a perfect life except for Jesus. Every one of them were faulted. Every one of them struggled with temptation, doubt, insecurities, lusts of the flesh. They struggled. But like Abraham, there will likely be lots of stumble all the way, along the way of our life, but faith is never stumbling. Instead, it's getting back up and it's looking to Jesus when we stand back up after we've stumbled and knowing that he is there because he promised to be there. He promised not to forsake us. That is faith. It's faith in what Jesus has promised us. So this morning, as we enter into this time of decision, if you need prayer, if you're struggling with something in your life, if something's going on and you're like, hey, I need that faith. I need that encouragement. Come pray. 
Pray with the person beside you, the person that you love, the person that came in with you, the person, I, I'll be up here. I will pray with you. I will encourage you. But that faith is there because God had promised it to be and his promise endures forever. And we are promised on what is to come and we need to live our life focused on that. Go ahead and stand. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just, I thank you, God. I thank you for the words that Paul wrote. Lord, connecting the, 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 the father of the faith, Abraham, Old Testament, pre-Jesus, connecting it to post-Jesus and saying, guys, he was saved before he did any work. He was saved by his faith alone and you fulfilled your promise with Jesus. Connecting the Old and New Testament, Lord, thank you for that. Father, I just pray that you go before us this week. Lord, if this message has revealed an area in our life that, that we were blind to, if it's revealed something in our life and the Holy Spirit is pressing on us and encouraging us, God, I pray that we have the courage to follow where the Holy Spirit is leading. God, where you're leading us, that we apply this text to our life, that we study this text out more, that we ask the tough questions, and God, that we seek you in all that we do, because Lord, you have promised, you have promised that you will return, you have promised us a life after this, and Lord, we just, we, we cling to that, it's in your son's name we pray, amen.